Uh, what we're going to try to talk about today is uh, how to maintain your table saw, set it up, that sort of thing. I think Jerry's going to take most of it. Uh, you want to go on with it, Jerry? Or? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have examples of every saw in here. Uh, I actually have a cabinet saw at home, which is sort of an upgrade from this. Uh, but I'm going to first talk about different kinds of saws and why you would care, okay? And then we'll talk about uh, setting up a table saw. How many people, well, I should ask, who does not have a table saw? <laughs> All right. That takes care of that, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so we're just going to go through the types of table saws first, and then we'll talk about the things you need to check on uh, a saw, and uh, then we'll talk uh, about maintenance. And the reason I do the tune-up first is um, uh, some of the maintenance is based on some of the tune-up procedures. Okay. So, uh, give me, you got to right up there is where you're thing, or there you go. Okay. First, I'm going to talk about portable style saw. These are relatively new. This is a Bosch here. That's a jet that's up there on the screen. And anymore, a contractor would actually use that kind of saw instead of this. Why? That's a whole lot more portable. Uh, give me the next slide. Okay. They're relatively inexpensive. Uh, you can get them uh, starting around about $500 and going up to the new saw stop is $1,300 like this. So that's sort of the range there. <clears throat> but what we're looking at here is typically the uh, blade is attached directly to the motor and so it's a direct drive. There's no belt. Hopefully I can tip this thing over without. Yeah, really. You can see the motor <coughs> is attached directly to uh, the uh, blade. You can't see the blade, but this whole housing here uh, goes up and or down or rotates. Uh, so that's typically the way the uh, portable saws are made. Uh, it's great for, say, a contractor, but a, uh, for uh, precise work, I wouldn't recommend this kind of saw. If you're a carpenter, that's fine. Uh, carpenters, uh, if you've ever watched them, if they're within a quarter of an inch, they're happy. Yeah. Yeah, a quarter of an inch is actually pretty <coughs> precise for a carpenter. <laughs> uh, it does need a 10 inch blade. And you can, uh, of course, uh, this one, does it have a driving knife? I can't tell. Some of them do. I know the new, no, this one does not. The uh, new saw stop has a riving knife on it, so uh, that's a fairly new concept. Uh, that that, that that's that assembly there functions um, as a riving knife. It's a splitter, yeah. Yep. I don't know if it goes up and down with the blade or not. Yes. Yes, yes it does. <laughs> that's a, that's, that's a, a riving knife. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> no dust collection. Yeah. Uh, generally, they don't have any dust collection. I happen to notice this Bosch does. Yeah, the, because the blade is completely surrounded, and yeah. uh, you can attach a, a hose here. But if you look at some of the cheaper ones, everything just goes on the ground. But often uh, you're using this outside anyway, so you wouldn't really care you know, about dust collection. I believe that's an OSHA requirement now. Uh, the next step up is what's called a contractor saw. This is a contractor saw. Uh, I. Most contractors, like I say, use this kind of saw anymore because that's obviously a lot more portable than this is. All right. Carrying this around on the job site is not exactly the greatest thing in the world, <coughs> although it's doable. But imagine loading this thing in a pickup truck every time you want to go from one job to another or putting it on a trailer. So it's a hell, heck of a lot heavier. So you can barely lift one side of it. Generally, uh, these are, uh, though, have uh, lighter trunnions on them, and the uh, motor is suspended from the uh, trunnion, and it's a belt drive. This, uh, most contractor saws only have one belt. Uh, you'll, as you'll find out, the next step up from this, they usually have two or three belts to drive it. 
The only problem with this is uh, potential for slip, slippage if you stall the uh, blade. But hopefully you're not cutting that way so that you stall the blade. If you are, you, you're feeding the stock too fast. How would you use two or three belts? It's just better uh, uh, traction between the motor and the uh, pulley. Yeah, so the power is... You got double belts on the same pulley? Or the same yeah, yeah, mine has three. Mine has three, yeah. The shaft on the motor has a uh, pulley with three she uh, three uh, locations for a V-belt, and uh, so does the Arbor. Yeah. You can also transmit more horse horsepower that way, okay? One of the problems with this kind of thing is when you tilt this whole thing, you got the motor hung from there, and it tends to torque the uh, Arbor and what, uh, so it might be a little out of whack. Okay. Uh, give me the next. Sure. Oh, okay. It has generally these have an open cabinet, no dust collection, no effective way to do it. Uh, I used to have a delta, and I had a bag <laughs> underneath here, but all that bag did was catch the stuff that fell down. You know, it didn't effectively remove it. Uh, usually has a cast iron top, which this does. These don't necessarily, uh, this is probably aluminum, I'm guessing. All right, some of them, uh, some of the cheap ones have plastic tops. The cast iron top is a much more desirable because it's usually flat, but that's one of the things you want to check. This is a precision straight edge. You know, is how flat is that table? Here, let me put it on. Uh, yeah, the, and it doesn't have to be exactly flat, by the way, but you want it fairly close, and you cer certainly wouldn't want to be able to rock this thing back and forth. Or, and check it this way, too. <coughs> Especially if you're looking at a used saw, and by the way, this one's for sale. And they're asking $400 for it. They took it in trade on the saw stop. And so these are the kinds of things that you want to look at if you're looking at a used saw. <coughs> Usually has a cast iron tabletop and stamped steel extensions. Now this one has a machine steel extensions on both sides, but uh, quite often you'll see uh, stamped sheet metal as your extension. And you want to be careful about that too because they can warp a whole lot easier than uh, the cast iron tabletop would. This is a typical trunnion for a uh, contractor saw. In fact, this one, I was looking at it because I hadn't seen this saw before today. And it's even a little heavier than what most of them are because it's got a cast iron uh, piece around the uh, arbor here, uh, which they don't usually have. Although I see the motor is actually attached with two rods. That's not real strong when you're... Uh, that's one of the reasons this thing deflects when you tilt it. It's because the support is not that great. Also, the trunnions, if you look closely, uh, the trunnions are just uh, slotted with a, a uh, piece that fits in the slot there. And uh, you'll see uh, on a cabinet saw, that's typically a gear with a, uh, a, a worm gear attached to it that you move. In this case, you just loosen it up and you it slides inside of those slots. Not quite as good. Okay, the next one. Next level is a cabinet saw. We don't have a cabinet saw in here, but I do have some pictures of uh, mine later on when we talk about uh, tune-up. That happens to be a jet. Mine's a uh, Delta Unisaw, and uh, of course Pyromatic makes one, and everybody. there's a number of people who make them. They, uh, next slide. The main thing is uh, it's more expensive. I failed to mention this is a step up from that. Typically, uh, they're asking $400 for this, but you typically you'd be new, you'd be paying $1,000 or more for something like this. I don't know what this was a uh, Home Depot special. I don't know what they sell them for. Craftsman's the same thing. Yeah, Craftsman's the same thing. Yeah. So, and I failed to mention too, this is usually like a one and a half horsepower motor, one to one and a half horsepower. Once you step up to the cabinet saw, you're typically talking uh, uh, higher horsepower, three horsepower or more. Some of them have five. 
one of the things that's not on my slide that you need to be aware of, you can run three horsepower on a 110 circuit. Five horsepower, you're going to have problems. You need a 220 circuit as a minimal if you're going to go up to five. And uh, why would you care? Well, five is going to have a whole lot more power than three, of course, and uh, you can cut thicker stock more easily. But also, uh, if you have problems with kickback, like Rob here, it's going to come out of there a lot faster, too. <laughs> I didn't measure it, but it did come out pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> and the trunnions are typically cast iron or, or machine steel. And as I said before, the uh, the lower, the raising and lower mechanism and the uh, tilting mechanism is typically a gear that's being uh, turned with a uh, worm gear. And uh, that's much more uh, stout, much more reliable. They usually have uh, closed uh, cabinets. I don't think I've ever seen one that doesn't, hence the name cabinet saw. And it usually has like a four inch uh, outlet for a uh, dust collection. At least. Yeah, at least could be bigger. Generally your cast iron, your table is cast iron and your extensions are cast iron, although not always true because some people put a uh, melamine extension on one side. As a matter of fact, my saw does have a melamine extension on one side. Not very mobile. You can buy a mobile basis for these things, but you better only want to have to move it from this here to over there, you know, because you're not going to be loading it up in a uh, truck or anything very easily unless you take it apart. Uh, oh, those cabinet saws start around $2,000 and up. This is a typical trunnion that comes out. That's a Powermatic uh, PM66. So you can see the trunnion very clearly there. And that's only got a single, I just noticed it's only got a single belt on it, unless that's multiple belts, and I just don't see it. Oh, and it's two. It's two belts. It's hard to see. <clears throat> but you also see the, uh, the arbor shaft. Or, uh, very clearly there, which is a really <coughs> fundamental part of your uh, your saw. In fact, when we get into tune-up, uh, that's one of the critical things. The two critical things there are, uh, hopefully the shaft is straight, it was machine straight. Uh, it might have been bent accidentally somehow, uh, but it would take an extreme amount of, look of force to bend it though. But more importantly, the bearings, what kind of bearings are in there, uh, what kind of condition those bearings are in. Because yes, uh, they're typically ball bearings or roller bearings. And the other, you are really reliable if they're new, uh, they eventually wear. And you'll get some play. So it's one of the things we'll talk about. But you see, that's pretty heavy duty. Uh, trying, okay, the other thing I, that reminded me, the other thing I failed to mention, and I should have, is the trunnions for a contractor saw are attached to the bottom of the tabletop. On a uh, cabinet saw, the trunnion is actually attached to the cabinet. Why would you care? If your blade is misaligned, how you adjust your uh, blade alignment to your miter slot is different. On this particular case, I would have to loosen the bolts underneath, at least three of them, <coughs> and move the trunnion until I got it lined up. In the case of a cabinet saw like that, <coughs> what I can do is loosen the tabletop and move the tabletop, which is actually a little easier than trying to get underneath here and adjust your trunnion because it's attached to the table. <coughs> Next slide. Hybrid saws, I didn't really put a picture in there. Uh, they're fairly new. And it's been around for a little while. It's a it's a sort of a combination of a contractor saw and a cabinet saw. They're generally cheaper than a cabinet saw, and they do have an enclosed cabinet, but they sit off the floor like this does. There's open space underneath it like that. Next. Finally, is a European style saw, and some of you will recognize that one. <laughs> came out of Sherman's shop. It's uh, an Italian saw actually uh, made by SCM, which is now SCMI. And if you're interested, uh, they sell those kinds of saws. Uh, not movable very easily. <laughs> <laughs> Takes up a lot of space. In fact, uh, you guys had, what, four people over there taking this thing apart to move it? Yeah. You literally had to take it apart to move it. But a couple of features there, it 
the tabletop is just a long uh, flat bed like a joiner would be. But on the uh, one side there is a sliding table. See the arms sticking out there? And the post coming up from that, that's a sliding table. So you can throw a piece, sheet of plywood on there and just shove it right through the salt. Uh, so a lot of uh, professional cabinet shops and people like that have those kinds of saws. And that's also where the idea of the riving knife came from. The European saws have had riving knives for a long time. The American saws have not, although they're starting to appear on American saws. <coughs> Now, and it's a safety feature because it goes up and down with the blade, so your splitter's always in line with your blade. <coughs> uh, it also has dust collection. In fact, that's the dust collector in the back wall back there, which I now have, but it's in a pile on my floor. It's like, generally they have multiple belt drives again, and they uh, are long, uh, have a long, narrow table like you saw, but with a, an attached sliding table. And so instead of pushing something through with a miter uh, gauge, you'd be pushing with that uh, sliding table. Riving knife, I mentioned, they generally have much higher horsepower. That they'll be five horsepower or greater. All right. And in fact, some of these saws are three phase, 223 phase. Some of them are 443 phase. Ask your power company to install a 443 phase line in your house and see what they're going to charge you. <laughs> but a lot of industrial shops already have that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, much larger footprint. You're not going to be moving that unless you start taking it apart to move it. Okay. Next slide. I want to mention one more thing, too. The nice thing about those saws, too, though, they have a scoring blade often, which is a second saw blade just ahead of the, of the main saw blade. I'm glad you brought that up, yeah, because yeah. I think it's really beautiful. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. That is made here in Georgia. Was it? Yeah, I well, think it's Buford. What it does is it cuts the vernier very, very thinly before the blade hits it, so it makes for a fantastic cut. Yeah, and that's fantastic. especially important with something like melamine, because yeah. you're putting a scoring slot through the melamine before you actually cut the board. Awesome. So it doesn't chip out on you. Okay. Uh, use saws, uh, like this one. I only put that in there because it's some of the things you need to think about. Check for rust. This one's pretty clean. Light rust is not a problem. If you've got heavy rust and it's pitted, it could become an issue. Uh, it depends on how extensive that is. It might not be something that you want to mess with. You can usually clean it up with steel wool and mineral spirits, uh, but if it's heavily pitted, you might have something that you, is not usable to you. If there's a lot of rust on top, you better believe there's going to be a lot of rust underneath. Yeah, and you also you need to look at your arbor uh, shaft and your uh, uh, the trunnions and whatnot and see how much rust there is on them because they, you might not be able to operate them very well if it's heavily rusted. Run the saw if possible and listen for unusual noises. We're talking about something other than what you normally hear of the saw blade going around. Okay any kind of clunking or anything like that or some screeching or something that tells you that something's wrong. Could be a bad arbor or, uh, or uh, no, namely the arbor bearings could be bad or it could be the motor bearings. If it's a motor, that's something that's replaceable although those motors aren't cheap. Uh, if it's uh, arbor bearings, they can be replaced also. It's just a question of whether you want to mess with them or not because a lot of them are press fit in and uh, you have to have a hydraulic press to get it in or out. <coughs> Not all of them, but some of them are. And again, most of us don't have a hydraulic press. I know some of us do, but not everybody. <laughs> Check for blade wobble. Uh, uh, if you can run the thing, just look at the blade and see if it's moving. Or turn it off, unplug it, and take it and just turn it with some sort of reference point to see if that blade is doing this kind of thing. Uh, it could be the blade, by the way, and when we talk about tune-up, we'll talk about how you eliminate the possibility that the blade's not flat. Uh, what you're really concerned about is the arbor bearings and the motor bearings. You're not con concerned about the blade because it's a throwaway item anyway for most people if you're buying a new saw. 
check the movement of the fence. Does it move freely? Does it lock down well? Uh, doesn't move once it's locked down. Uh, you can also check what, how parallel the fence is to the miter saw uh, slot, and we'll talk about that in tune-up. Check the flatness of the table. I already talked about that. And you don't have to have a precision straight edge. You can buy a precision straight edge, edge for about $100. <laughs> How do you really need it? I don't think so. Availability of parts, especially if it's an older saw. How, if I need to replace something, how difficult is it going to be to replace it? Typically, the motor can be replaced easily enough, but uh, things like the arbor bearings might not uh, be able to find them easily, although you might be able to find a substitute, but you're going to have to look uh, for uh, sites that cell bearings and whatnot and find something that's going to work on that. <coughs> okay, next slide. This is my Unisaw. Uh, I bought this one used. I bought it from an estate sale. Uh, you can see it's uh, got quite a few uh, add-ons to it. And uh, there's, there's a cabinet saw. Right now I have a dedicated uh, dust collection on that. And you can actually, if you look over here on the side over there, you can see parts of my dust collection system that are still in a pile there, <laughs> which I got from an estate sale I haven't put together yet. So eventually that dedicated uh, dust collector will disappear. Uh, however, even a cabinet saw, it does not <coughs> collect dust that well. I'm here to tell you, I opened up that cabinet saw and I have a bunch of dust in the bottom of it, so it's not sucking it all out. It's the heavier <coughs> stuff, not the lighter stuff, but it's in there. Okay, let's get into tune-up now. Tools needed. Uh, first of all, you can do it fairly simply, or you can go expensive. Uh, let's see here. Machinist blocks or drafting triangles. Okay, the machinist blocks, these are not really machinist blocks, they're just uh, metal uh, squares, okay? Uh, and they're precise. Uh, a machinist block would be within one ten thousandth of an inch square, you know, but they're expensive. I don't know how somebody had a machinist block in here and what did they pay for it? I can't remember. Oh, that was, uh, yeah, I had one, but I don't remember what I paid for it. And I bought this whole set for maybe 30 bucks, 40 bucks. I don't remember, you know. Uh, but anyway, you can also use drafting triangles. And these are cheap ones. There's a 90 and a 45, there's a 30 and a 60. Oh, sorry. <laughs> They're fairly accurate. Now, I have more accurate ones than that because I, I used to do some drafting, but uh, these are probably adequate for our needs. Okay. Uh, a straight edge. I'm using that level there as my straight edge. Or you can have dial indicator with its associated supports. This is one that I uh, bought here. Uh, comes in a little plastic box like this. And you can see the dial indicator in here. And it's adjustable. That one costs, it's got a magnetic base to it, so you turn the, the uh, knob and it sticks. Okay. 40 bucks for that one. Uh, the more expensive one is this A-line here. And it actually comes in a kit because there's other pieces here. You can use it for more than tuning a table saw. You can use it on drill press, a router table, a number of other things. That's relatively expensive. That's uh, $144. I just checked it. They got, out, got it on the shelf out here. They do have a cheaper version that's $80. Okay, but uh, that cheaper version is somewhat limited in what you can use it for. This one's a lot more versatile. You can also use a Wixley uh, digital gauge to check your angles, your saw uh, blade angles. And I'll show you how that works in a little bit. What else is on there? Oh, if you're going to use a simpler technique like this, this, I made that. It won't fit on this saw blade because it's too long. Uh, this saw, because it's too long, it was made for my delta. But the way this works is this is uh, put up against the blade or a little slight gap and then you use a, a set of mechanics feeler gauges to determine, okay, how much is that gap? 
and then uh, uh, you move it down to the end and you remeasure it and that gives you an idea of how parallel your miter slot is. And I've got a, a, a picture of that somewhere. Let's see. Check arbor assembly, okay? What you can do is just walk over here, reach down and grab it. Can you move it laterally? Can you move it in and out? Hopefully not. <laughs> if you can, it means something's wrong with the bearings, most likely. It so happens in this set here, they give you this little piece here. I didn't even know what you used it for until I watched the DVD. <laughs> it goes over the end of the shaft. Has plastic. Yeah, it has plastic screws, set screws there. And the reason that they're plastic is so you don't screw up the threads on the arbor shaft. All right. You wouldn't want to use a metal one because you might ding up those threads. And then you can just grab it by the end of that and see if there's any play in that arbor. And there's no noticeable play in this one. <coughs> Check arbor flange run out with the dial indicator. Okay, you can use either one of these. Although what I found is I could on this saw I could get it this one into my uh, delta opening, but on this one I couldn't get it in there. So basically, what you want to do is, and you need to rotate this thing because most of these won't reach that far down. And on mine, I turned it up to 45 degrees, and then put the uh, the dial indicator right against the flange there, and then you take the either with the belt or grab a hold of the, uh, uh, I wouldn't grab a hold of the arbor flange itself. Somehow the belts are the best way to turn that 360 degrees and see how much run out there is. I think it might be on the next slide. No? Okay. I do have a bunch of slides showing these. The, what? Oh, that just shows the belts back up. Uh, we'll get to it in a minute. But like, for instance, I was trying to get this down in there today, and I couldn't quite reach that flange with this setup. Uh, so this, even this is somewhat limited. And by the way, well, I discovered once you've got this thing set up and on the edge of that arbor, and I do have a picture of that, don't touch anything here. Because you think this is rigid? It's not. You know, they do make them that are really rigid, but that one's not. I, if I wanted to pay, 10 times $40, I might be able to get one that's rigid. Uh, I, I do have some pictures later on, so uh, go to the next one. Check pulleys and belts. Check for looseness of pulleys on the uh, arbor shaft or the motor. Typically, to do that, you would take the blade off. I'm not going to do that. I mean, the belt off. I'm not going to do that here. All right. And then you would uh, see if this... Uh, pulley on the motor is loose or not, all right? And then you, then you would do the same thing and the pulley on the, is right here, so you have to sort of reach up under there to, to uh, fill that one, okay? You also uh, want to check for alignment of pulleys, and this becomes, you'd have to get this cover off, and you would take a straight edge, and you'd put it up in there, and I don't have the room to do that, but anyway. You try to get the straight edge on the face of one pulley and the face of another pulley. And what you're looking for are those pulleys parallel to each other. Are they out of alignment? You'll see a gap on one or the other if they're out of alignment. That's going to cause vibration. It's also going to cause the saw to run rough. And you'll actually hear that. Okay? Uh, when you're running the thing, you'll be going, what's that? Whoop, 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 whoop noise. And it's the belt coming out of the groove and then going back in coming out and going back in. Sure, uh, you, uh, you also want to check the belt tension. This one actually appears to be pretty loose to me, but the motor's moving when I do that. Oh, it's actually designed to. I didn't realize that. This is The belt tension here is the weight of the motor. Most of them aren't that way. It's got some sort of adjustment that, uh, like a jack bolt or something that you screw out to adjust the tension. I, d I never... <coughs> That makes it easy to remove the belt, by the way. You can lock, there's a locking screw on the inside. Locking oh, here we go. Yeah, right there. Yeah, you can lock this one down. 
But generally, you want to, you you really need to look at your manual. Anybody ever read the manual? <laughs> you won't don't want more than about a quarter or a half inch of deflection in that belt at the center. Okay, that's the way you set your tension. Okay. Yeah, well, I think you'd have to push down here and then tighten that bolt until you got the right tension there. That's not too bad there, but. By the way, I have a lathe, an old uh, Warner Swayze lathe that's this way. The only tension on the belt is the motor hanging off that belt. Guess what? I never get a catch. It'll stop dead because <laughs> the motor kicks up. If you get a catch, the motor kicks up, it stops dead. Interesting concept. Okay. Uh, there's my uh, Delta Unisaw. That's got three belts on it. They're V-belts. V Some of these saws have uh, different design. Matter of fact, I, I noticed this one had a multiple grooves in the belt. I don't know if you can get a picture of that or not. And they'd be matching grooves in the pulley. Gives you a little more, a little more grip. Okay. Uh, I've never saw that one. Three uh, V-belts. I've never saw it. And, or had it slip on me that I was preparing. But again, that's down underneath the table. So in order to check that tension, I got to put my hand down in there and push on it. I failed to mention, always make sure that sucker is unplugged. You don't want to have your hands down there if it's plugged in. All right? First rule, safety rule. If you're going to have your hands down here, make sure your saw is unplugged. <clears throat> Next slide. Oh, there's the uh, checking the arbor run out on my saw. See how I tilted the arbor to 45 degrees, and that was so I could get in there easily. And I was. This is the setup I got here. And the way this thing works, by the way, let me see if I, is what you typically do is you put it up against there and you preload it so that it's reading something other than zero. All right. Once it's in there, then you, you can loosen this nut here, and you can turn, can't hold it tight still enough, turn this until you get to zero. Light tighten it back up. Now turn the arbor. You shouldn't have more than a thousandth of an inch run out in that arbor. Because one of the things you have to realize, whatever run out I got here is going to be multiplied by the diameter of the blade once I get out here even if the blade is flat. because So if i got a little bit of run out here, I'm going to get a lot more run out at the top of that blade. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, that's just a different view. Oh, back up. Oh, yeah, that's right. This, there is a difference here. One, I'm using this uh, setup here. Okay, the next one, I'm using Ricky's setup here. And by the way, I tried to do this on this saw. I don't even have a hope of getting close to that arbor on this saw, only because this opening is not really big enough for me to get in there. So you'd have to have some sort of uh, additional piece on here if you wanted to use this on this saw. Okay. <coughs> Next one. Check blade for blade alignment or wobble. Ideally, you'd like to have a flat blade. However, uh, unless you've got a flat uh, piece of granite or something to stick this on and then run your dial indicator around there, you're not going to know if it's flat or not. All right. uh, these kinds of blades, this is a laser cut blade, it's a Freud, generally are flat, relatively flat. If you buy a cheap blade, it's stamped out of sheet metal, it won't be flat, Jack. So I highly recommend that you buy a higher end blade that's laser cut. Freud is, Forrest is, there's a couple of others that do that, but like a forest blade will cost you $115, you know, that's an example. I don't know what this one costs, it's a glue line rip, I have one of these, by the way, I highly recommend them, but not in this shape, because uh, this blade's really in bad shape. I know, I switched through some of these things, and that made a world of difference. Uh, Glue line rip. Chop you, saw and, and table saw both have made a big difference. This glue line rip blade is on my table saw. I can rip a piece in no, two pieces. The other way around, Jerry. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Not paying attention. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Not a good idea. Unless you cut the plastic. Unless you cut the plastic. 
Yeah. I don't ever cut plastic on my table saw, but. I don't flip that around when I do. I just cut it the way it is. Yeah. And I'm not going to tighten this all the way up, but anyway. Apparently does. I'm not going to bother with it. So. <coughs> now, what you're concerned about is as this thing turns, that that top edge is going in and out. That's what's called blade wobble. And you can usually see it if you rip a piece of wood, and you'll see the uh, teeth marks on the inside. It tells you something's out of alignment. All right, it's what it tells you. Either it's the blade, or it's something else on your setup. And in this particular case, I can use either one of these you know, to uh, check the uh, blade. I don't particularly, I bought this thing, but I'm not real thrilled with it, by the way. But want is preloaded, then I would move the dial indicator until, see, it's actually moving when I touch it. That's why I don't like this setup too flexible. A machinist would never uh, settle for that. If I'm touching it and the, the uh, indicator is moving, <laughs> that means this, this uh, assembly is too flexible. And then you can literally, uh, I should have put it further down, you can literally move the blade and see how much. Uh, and, and where on the blade should you have it? As far out as possible. Unfortunately, I got it out to the point where it falls in the gullet when I, <laughs> you don't want it that way. Uh, yeah, that doesn't work too well. Uh, probably if I put it up here, closer to the top, there we go. So as far out on the blade as you can go, but below the gullet. Yeah. And below the, the laser well, you can't quite avoid those, but uh, you'll see the thing, the uh, indicator drop when you hit the the uh, slot, but then it'll come back, you know. You don't have to set this at zero, but if you don't, you better remember where it was set at. All right, because what's going to happen? Whoops! Is as I turn this, you saw it hit the slot there. As I turn this, what I want to do is turn it 360 degrees. There's 12, three thousandths, two thousandths, back to zero, negative two thousandths. Okay, there's this. Uh, I suspect this blade is bad. That's what I suspect. I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, I, I, you know, you'd have to check the arbor run out first. Because if it's at the arbor, it don't, won't matter what the blade is, right? What you can put the most expensive blade in the world on it. If the arbor runs out too much, it's, it's still going to wobble. But uh, the other way to get rid of the uh, potential for uh, the fact that the blade's not uh, flat is to start at one point, put a mark there with a, like a uh, sharpie or something like that. Unload this thing turn it. Well, you would want to start up front, by the way, when you do that. You would want to start with one of these teeth up front. And then you would turn it until that tooth is in the back, and then you re-measure this. It's hard to do it with this particular setup. It's easy to do it with this setup, because I can just slide it from one side to the other. Let me show you how that works. One of the nice things about this one set up, by the way, is you can not only do your blade, you can also do your fence. You can also do it with this setup, but you've got to have the right length block to do it. Now, in this case, I'm going to set this to zero. Okay. And now I've got this tooth here in the front. Okay, and what I will do then is move it to the back, the same tooth. I don't have it marked, so I'm keeping my finger on it. Read it again. That's six thousandths. Okay. 
I don't know if you can see that clearly or not, but uh, I can see it. It's moved off the zero by six thousandths of an inch. That's not. That's assuming that your miter slot's perfect. Yeah, uh, we haven't checked the miter slot yet, but uh, that's uh, one of the things that you want to do too is make sure that your miter. Well, it could either be here or it could be here. Most likely, in this case, this is the blade. You could also always get a brand new blade and try it, you know. Uh, let's see what else is up there. You can use your miter gauge and attach a block to it. Anyway, what you do is you put the miter gauge in there and you would clamp a block to your miter gauge and then put like a screw in the end of it and then you can use your miter gauge. But make sure your miter gauge is accurate and set at 90 degrees, although it really doesn't matter. The only reason you want it set at 90 degrees so you've got a flat surface <coughs> near the blade, like so. Imagine that this was attached to the miter uh, gauge. So you don't have to get that, that simple. That run out should be three thousandths of an inch or less. Hopefully less. I know it was like two on mine. Uh, there's uh, me checking the top of the blade on my saw with this uh, set up here. And then it's put at the top of the blade and you can just run the blade around. Okay, and it'll give you an accurate reading if that blade's relatively flat. The only problem with that is you've got to be sure that the blade is flat. Or hope that it's flat. Okay. That is me doing it with this in the miter slot. Okay. <coughs> By the way, <coughs> see that is smaller. And run it up against the blade. I can't even get it out of there. <laughs> there. See, it's too long for this one. My miter slot's further away than this is. So I'd have to recut this and put this little uh, thing back in there. But what you're seeing there is I got a small gap there and I've got the feeler gauge stuck in there. Whatever fits, once it's locked in, I don't know what it was, and then uh, you move it, you mark that tooth, turn the blade until that tooth comes back up on the back side, slide that down to the end where that same tooth and recheck it. If you do it that way, you're taking the blade flatness out of the equation because you're using the same tooth. All right. Next slide. Okay, that's where it is on the end. And, uh, I don't recall that there wasn't any more than a uh, thousandth of a difference in my case. Okay. Does that help to have the blade uh, raised up to do that? As much as so possible. A, well, I mean, especially if you're checking the top. Yeah. You want the blade all the way up. Right? If you're checking it up here at the top. Uh, that's using a uh, Ricky setup here. What did I do with it? Instead of a block, I'm using this. Same kind of thing, though. It goes in a miter slot. And by the way, this is spring-loaded. That's nice. It's hard to, for you to see, but there are little balls, ball bearings on the inside of this that are spring-loaded. So it snaps down in there, and not only that, the springs keep that against this edge of the miter slot, which is what you want. There can be some uh, slop in this, although... I have a piece of this uh, UMHW, and it was leaning against the wall. Can you see that? Yeah. I, guess what? I've got a spring-loaded <laughs> device. <laughs> Not deliberately, mind you. <laughs> but that snaps in, and it stays. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, and that's checking the front tooth and then the back tooth, okay, with, uh, with this set up here. Okay. Check if fence is uh, parallel. Can I, uh, what do you do if it's not right on a cabinet saw, there's bolts under the bottom, you don't want to loosen them all the way up. You want to just loosen them up to snug, and you don't want to loosen all of them. You want to, because you can get it way out. Yeah. Really fast. So you want to loosen it enough to where you can take a rubber mallet and just tap it. Tap on the edge of the table. Sometimes it takes a little while for them to come loose. So sometimes you have to loosen it a good bit, tap it, get it loose, tighten it back up. And you're just talking about 
an incredibly small amount, but it's incredibly important at this point. So on a cabinet saw, it's pretty easy. Yeah. On a, a contractor saw, I never could do it <laughs> and get it right. I never did get my little brass well, work think, perfect. Think about that. You have to get under the table here, loosen the nuts that are attaching the arbor to the table, and then you don't tap the tabletop, you tap the arbor to get it to come over, either right or left, whichever way you need to go. Yeah. Same thing, it's four bolts. You don't want to loosen all four bolts. Uh, you want to loosen three of them, yeah. snug. Right. And if you can, you leave the other one tight so that when you move it, you're pivoting about that point always, okay? It's kind of a two-man job on, on a contractor saw like that. One, kind, one guy kind of has to watch the gauge. The other guy has to do the adjustment. I don't know of any other way you can do it. I never could get mine completely perfect. Yeah. But you could get it pretty darn close. Yeah, there, uh, keep that in mind that because that's because the uh, arbor on a contractor saw is attached to the tabletop, bottom of the tabletop. Whereas an arbor on the uh, cabinet saw is actually attached to the cabinet. That's why on a cabinet saw you can just move the table to change the relationship of the blade and the miter slot. That's what you're trying to do is get the miter slot parallel to the blade. On a cabinet saw you get it head on. Yeah, they actually make aftermarket adjusters even for contractor saw. They were relatively expensive. They go on your uh, mounting bolts. Where did you get that one from? Sure. <laughs> How often do you have to That's the adjuster. This is a contractor saw trunnion? Yeah. Okay, and so it's underneath like this. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you still have to turn it upside down. These are aftermarket brackets here. It's what you're looking at. They're put on and then it's retightened, and you got a little uh, Allen uh, screw here that you can use to move this <coughs> back or forth, forward or backwards. That's that's not standard on a uh, contractor saw. Yeah. Dan helped me do mine a year or two ago with that setup that uh, Ricky has, and uh, it took a little while, but it worked out an excellent job. Well, the problem you have without these is is this washer on here makes a little bit, has got a little bit of a groove worn in that trunnion, and you move it and get it just right, and you tighten it back up, and it goes back into the groove that's there initially before. Yeah, that's so the... what these do is it allows you to micro-adjust it, and, and you, you clamp it from both sides, and then when you tighten down, it doesn't move. I don't know what these cost, do you know? I don't think they're that expensive. Yeah. Anyway, they're, they're these, these are what I refer to as jack bolts, and all you're doing is loosening one side and tightening the other side to line them up. The, the advantage is, like uh, Dan said, it holds them in place once you start to tighten down the nuts. Okay. Because that'll drive you nuts. Like he's talking about, you tighten it and it's out of alignment.